Hi, everyone. Welcome to this webinar. In about six weeks, we will complete two years since the World Health Organization declared the COVID-19 pandemic. Uncountable changes have been imposed on every health service in the world. We have all lost colleagues, patients, friends, and family members. As physicians and scientists working in headache field, we face other challenges. Many headache patients uh, lost their follow-up. Many headache departments become COVID-specific areas. And uh, this has been a, a very challenging time for all of us. Today, we are gathered here for this webinar where three headache experts with numerous publications on this area will present data regarding headache and COVID-19. We hope you all can enjoy the webinar and we encourage you to send questions through the Q&A, which is in the bottom of your Zoom. Uh, and we, after all the presentations, we will be asking the panelists uh, and uh, I hope you can wait for and uh, send your questions. So we start now, and it's my pleasure to introduce you, Dr. Patricia Pozorosic. She's director of the Migraine Adaptive Brain Center at the Brown University Hospital in Barcelona, Spain. And she's also a member of the Board of Trustees and Honorary Secretary at the IHS. I also introduce you, Dr. Eduardo Carona, who is a neurologist currently working at the headache unit at Valdebron and PhD candidate. He's also resident and research fellow section representative in the communication community, uh, committee of the European Academy of Neurology. They will talk to us about headache after COVID-19, time to unravel the long-term consequences and effect. It's a, I look very, for, very much forward to, to the presentation. Please, Patricia, you can share your screen and start the presentation. Thank you, Marshall, and uh, thank you, Henrik, for, for inviting us to share with you um, what we are learning uh, on the post, you could say, pandemic. Let's see if this um, sorry, goes into full screen. Perfect. Um, so thank you all, and, and thank you, I think, also, uh, David, for, for the initiative. So uh, headache after COVID-19, and it's the time to unravel the long-term consequences. I thought this was a very, you know, a nice way of, of um, uh, sharing with all of you uh, what we have learned uh, from uh, patients, most of them, those patients who went through uh, the first wave of the pandemic, first and second waves, um, and what the consequences of, the, of this post-COVID syndrome are. My disclosures are all of this, but there is there are none in relation to what I'm going to present today. So um, we, we, we have to start and that's my task for today. And I will leave then um, the rest of, of uh, the talk to Eduardo Carona because I think he has led this effort in our group and it's um, the time for him to, to share all of this information that he has collected. Uh, you know, in these last uh, two years with all of you. But I will start by trying to already create a bit of complexity and trying to, to share with you, because you'll see it's not that easy. What is the definition that we know nowadays or we understand on acute and post-acute uh, COVID uh, disease? And we, because you all know that COVID actually means a disease which is secondary to an infection by SARS coronavirus 2. So, Mm, the definition of acute COVID is from disease onset up to week four. And then after that, you have post-acute uh, COVID-19 uh, syndrome, you could say. Uh, this graph here, which was published uh, quite recently, actually shows very well what, what we think is going on. You have acute COVID, as you can see. Um, then uh, after four weeks, some patients are you know letting us know that they have all of these symptoms that uh, i mean not all of them in the same patient but all of these symptoms are considered to be uh, post-covid um, syndrome and it starts on week four and then it can move on as you can see by the graph up to week 12. Um, however we've realized that some other patients uh, continue to have symptoms after week 12 and that is what we call post-covid 19 condition so nowadays, post-COVID, post-acute, sorry, COVID-19 
is divided into ongoing symptomatic COVID-19, which goes from week four to week 12. And then we have what now is being called by the World Health Organization, post-COVID-19 condition, which goes from week 12 and is usually from what information that we have nowadays in many patients ongoing. However, the NICE guidelines in the UK have tried to, you know, yes, probably talk about all of this in one term, which is uh, the, the word long COVID. However, uh, you know, I would say that the wording is still not uh, properly, you know, used, I would say. Um, so, well, you have it in this slide and, and we will try to be accurate with what uh, the wording that we are using. So in this, uh, this kind of consensus that was done in a Delphi way, uh, defined what is the clinical case or the clinical cases that enter or that are considered to be a post-COVID-19 condition. And as you can see and read from, um, from the slide, this is a condition that occurs in individuals with a history or probable history. That the word probable comes because, as you all know, in the first wave of the pandemic, not everyone had a positive PCR because PCRs were not done as much. And um, so it is something that happens, as you see, usually three months from the onset of COVID-19 symptoms, and that lasts at least for two months and cannot be fully explained by an alternative diagnosis. Um, the, I would say most common symptoms um, are fatigue, shortness of breath, cognitive dysfunction, and actually um, headache. Okay, so, sorry, I think this was blocked now. Okay, so moving on. Um, what is the epidemiology here? So there are several studies that have been already published. This one coming from the UK, for example, which is, I would say, almost kind of scary um, because in the UK, as you can read here, 12%, uh, I sorry, 12, 2% of the population have long COVID, which is this uh, mixture of, of uh, after four weeks, but ongoing after already 12 weeks after the disease. So the idea here is that a lot of people, in my opinion, personally, but that's you know, probably a bit of my subjective uh, thoughts about this, have long COVID. And uh, um, specifically from the long COVID that these patients have, as you can see, uh, sorry here, I want to go just quickly go back, 21% uh, of them have symptoms, uh, you know, from the whole uh, yeah, cohort of patients that were collected, 21%, less than 12 weeks of symptoms, a lot, 70% of this 2% have been having symptoms for more than 12 weeks, and 40% have symptoms for more than one year. So um, as I said, uh, the number of patients that are growing with this condition is, is important, I would say. In regards to then the symptoms, you know, and, and um, the prevalence of these symptoms, this was a very interesting study published. Uh, they did a you know, 21 meta-analysis. Um, so they, they meta-analyzed 21 uh, yeah, meta-analyses that have been done. 47,000 or almost 48,000 patients were included. And the follow-up was a bit you know, dependent from 14 to 110 days. And what they saw here is that more or less, as you can see from this slide, uh, the two most prevalent symptoms of this you know, long COVID condition are fatigue and headache. And uh, approximately in the study, they found that patients that were included in the meta-analysis, so more or less 0.47% of them had headache. It is uh, also quite a, an important, I would say, percentage, you could say, from the estimates that were done. And now let's go back to our uh, initial study, the study that was published in Cephalalgia. Um, where we had followed our cohort of initial first wave patients uh, in our hospital. These were uh, patients, for those who perhaps have not read the study, that had um, moderate to severe COVID because they actually were recruited in the emergency room or in the hospitalization period. So there were patients that would actually had to go to the hospital. And if you all remember when we were all confined, um, we didn't go to the hospital if we were not kind of, you know, in a not well stayed, you could say. So what we saw in our study is that the mean number of days that patients suffered from acute headache was around 15. And that we did a follow-up of our cohort of patients. And after six weeks, 
37.8 of patients still had headache from our initial percentage, which was quite a high percentage. We said that 74% of our patients more or less had suffered from headache with COVID. Um, you know, that was perhaps one of the biases of the study because neurologists were the ones who were recruiting patients and we were and wanted to be aware of a headache and other neurological symptoms. Um, from these patients, 50% of them, so those have, that had prolonged headache, 50% um, promised that they had never had a headache before. As you know, the mean age of, of our cohort of patients was around 50. So, I mean, you, you probably have had that time in your life to suffer from a headache ever. And from these patients that had, uh, you know, a long, uh, you know, constant headache, the headache was referred as uh, not cyclic, you could say, but constant and, and quite um, invalid, so disabling. And that because the response to treatment, the typical treatments that everyone can think of, was insufficient. I wanted also to, um, you know, think about what had happened to the Chinese cohort of patients. And uh, those initial Wuhan patients that were published uh, um, and where we saw in the acute phase that the Chinese population referred to 10% uh, of headache, actually after six months of, of follow-up of this cohort of patients, 20% uh, of them, so a 2% total, but it was a 20% of them, um, of the ones who had initial headache, continued to have headache. So even in the Chinese population, where the percent, initial percentage of headache was lower, uh, they were also seeing that six months after, um, you know, a, quite an important group of these patients were still with headache. So I, you know, our cohort, 37, 35% more or less of our patients continue to have headache after six weeks. In the Chinese cohort, after six months, 20% of these patients still have headache. And that's something important to consider because headache is one, I think, of the important symptoms in this uh, condition, even in China. <laughs> this other very interesting uh, study was done in an online fashion, which allowed, as you can see, uh, 3,700 patients or uh, participants to participate uh, from 56 countries. So it was very global and very kind of just inclusive from all of kind of the possible, um, yeah, you know, uh, waves of the different pandemics. This was done very recently. And what they saw was that they wanted to study long COVID and or prolonged COVID symptoms. And this COVID lasting for more than 28 days had in their um, survey, I mean, they found that these patients were suffering from about the 203 symptoms, which are very similar to the ones shown in the initial figure that I was um, showing to you. And from all of this survey of patients, after, of course, only one month, which is not a lot, but more than 28 days, and there were patients in every a bit of stage, like in the other studies, more than 70% of them had headache. So, um, that already was, uh, gives you another very interesting number, high percentages of headache. And what this study did was that they actually, as you can see a bit, followed patients for seven months, so after 28 days, but up to seven months. And what they saw was that different symptoms behaved in different manners, you could say, with different you know, uh, trends. Um, some symptoms were, initial, were, were there at the beginning, but with time after the initial weeks, as you can see, 25 weeks, then the symptoms started to fade away. Other symptoms were not too present initially, like in cluster three here, but were, were kept on increasing in their, in their presence um, along the weeks to come after the infection. And then we have cluster two in the middle where uh, the symptoms were already there initially and seem not to wait off or wait away. And they actually are quite stable. So headache as a symptom belongs um, according to this study to cluster two. And finally, I want to share with you this study that was already has been already accepted in uh, cephalalgia led by here, uh, Dr. Uh, Garcia Thorin, who is the third speaker for today. Um, with This was uh, led by him, but um, included patients that came from around Spain. This is a multicentric uh, um, perspective, uh, you could say, study in the sense that we all wanted to study prospectively our patients, although uh, we looked at it um, when as the months went on. 
And what we did was follow up uh, the patients in the different hospitals that had been included in the initial wave in Spain. And uh, we found or we, we arrived to a quite a large sample of 905 patients. Um, the mean age and, and the characteristics uh, were very similar to other, um, I would say, uh, studies published in, the, in relation to headache and, and COVID. And as you can see by the p-values here, uh, most of these patients had had pneumonia. The severity was there. Uh, so what I mean is that um, these patients uh, seem to be, um, uh, I mean, severe, but with a milder type of COVID uh, than the ones who probably died or, or, or um, were very severely affected by it. So maybe, as we had already mentioned in our study, headache can be somewhat protective or the presence of headache. And then in regards to the type of headache, and its characteristics, a phenotype of this headache, as you can see, is that um, it had, in many cases, a throbbing quality, but sometimes even pressing, which is more like uh, if you were wearing a helmet. Um, patients referred uh, photophobia and phonophobia, and it worsened with movement. So I would say quite uh, migraine-like characteristics, uh, if you look at it that way. But in my opinion, the most important figure of the paper is this one that I'm showing here, which is how the curve of at least uh, the presence of headache um, changes with time. And as you can see, most of the patients improve in the first two months um, of this post-acute COVID condition, which means that it goes from, as I was saying before, uh, so week five, you could say, until uh, week eight. Um, after two months, only 20% of patients are left with headache. And it seems that once there's this drop, then these patients stabilize in time, which means that um, if your patient tells you that they have had headache for more than three months since the beginning of the acute COVID condition, there is a lesser chance of this headache improving at least with uh, time and time for us was a ninth month follow-up. So that is something important and interesting to, to understand. And now I will um, stop sharing uh, my slides and I will give the floor to Dr. Carona. Thank you, Edo. Hi, everybody. Just a second, just let me share my screen. Okay, so uh, what about headache characteristics? So uh, this actually we received quite a relevant number of referrals for uh, persistent COVID-19 headache. And this is our court from uh, after the first wave of the pandemic. And as Dr. Pozorosic has already mentioned, uh, migraine-like features were common. But we also have to consider that 65% of patients had uh, personal migraine history and that also around two thirds of patients had a mild COVID-19 disease. So we then wanted actually to uh, better look into those patients with migraine-like features and with mild COVID-19 disease, because the feeling was that although they shared these uh, characteristics, other aspects were actually different. And, um, and so we described, we published recently uh, in headache, a case series of uh, three patients that represent uh, the prototypes of patients that we see at our outpatient clinics. So for example, you can see here uh, patient one, patient one had a personal uh, migraine history, uh, while patient two and patient three, three did not. And for example, patient one, patient two had a headache starting since the acute phase of the pandemic, while patient three uh, had the headache starting after the resolution of the infection. And then also there were all different concomitant post-COVID uh, symptoms. So um, actually what we hypothesize is that there is a spectrum of persistent post-COVID-19 headache. And probably these different characteristics uh, are due to different pathophysiological mechanisms. So what about uh, pathophysiology? So when we uh, studied the, uh, when we tried to understand COVID-19 headache during the acute phase, we, uh, we have to consider you know, the, three, the, the three main components, which is the virus, the host, and the brain. 
and of course their interactions. So the neurological mechanisms, the systemic and the uh, neuroinflammation, and of course the direct viral damage to the brain. But this is the acute phase. In the post-acute phase, probably the same interaction uh, are still present, but uh, the mechanism are slightly different. So for example, we should consider autoimmunity. Maybe we can hypothesize that there is persistent inflammation and brain damage. And also there may be a smoldering low level infection in tissues. And of course, above, above all, uh, there is the genetic predisposition. So what about autoimmunity? Here there is uh, a new study that has been published in Nature that observed that post-COVID-19 patients had a um, high prevalence of autoantibodies against immunomodulatory proteins. And the interesting thing in this study is that they uh, found that the, the murine surrogates of these autoantibodies can actually exacerbate the COVID-19 disease in a mouse model of coronavirus. So probably autoimmunity can play a role in um, COVID-19 symptoms and especially in post-COVID-19 uh, the condition. And why headache? Because headache too can be associated with autoimmunity if we remember that headache is a common symptom in autoimmune diseases. And then we should take into account inflammation. For example, this study has observed that uh, there are high levels of cytokines uh, persisting in the blood from six to nine months after uh, hospitalization. The problem here is that uh, studies are still uh, controversial about the persistence of systemic inflammatory molecules after, uh, after the acute phase. So what, what is more likely to happen is that there is the persistence of a local inflammation and, lo and local damage that occurred after the, the acute phase. Um, so, for example, in the brain, we can consider three main mechanisms. So there is the vascular damage that uh, from one side can uh, lead to the formation of microthrombi and from the other side can produce a leakage in the blood vessels. vessels. So from this, uh, due to this leakage, actually cytokines, uh, immune cell uh, can enter and can activate the uh, microglia and this can lead to neuroinflammation. And then finally, neuroinflammation can of course produce uh, neuronal damage. So, of course, these three mechanisms can act at the level of the trigeminal vascular system, and this can be involved in headache in the post-acute phase of COVID-19, and especially into uh, they could be involved in for the for the migraine-like features, the migraine-like phenotype. But also, we have to consider other um, structures and other brain areas. For example, this study has observed that the coronavirus is able to inflame uh, the barrier uh, cells in the choroid plexus, and then this inflammation is relayed in the brain parenchyma. And specifically, this inflammation affects um, neurons and upregulates inhibitory neurons, VIP inhibitory neurons, and downregulate excitatory neurons. So it produces a cortical uh, dysfunction that can be responsible for a neurological uh, persisting uh, symptom. And then uh, the study, for example, showed an hypometabolism in different uh, brain regions like uh, frontal areas, the right temporal lobe, the brainstem, and the cerebellum in long COVID uh, patients. And also studies from uh, post-mortem samples also uh, confirmed that actually, for example, in the brainstem and the cerebellum, there is this persistent inflammation because there is an activation of microglia and infiltration by cytotoxic uh, T lymphocytes. So in general, what we can say is that not only the trigeminal vascular system, but also different areas can be involved. And one of them can be the brainstem, because we all know that some structures in the brainstem are involved in migraine pathophysiology, and maybe their dysfunction during uh, the context of COVID-19 can lead to headache and also to other uh, persistent symptoms. Then there is another hypothesis. Uh, some research researchers are uh, actually uh, hypothesizing that maybe there some inflammation may come from a low-level uh, infection smoldering in tissues. Uh, 
So this, this study in nature has observed the presence of coronavirus antigens uh, in the gut four months after the infection in, in individuals that uh, were uh, testing negative. And also the presence of a smoldering low level infection uh, seem to be somehow mm, supported by, I would say, anecdotal reports of a patient with long COVID improving after uh, vaccination. However, this mechanism should be further uh, investigated. And right now we don't have data about this mechanism occurring within the brain, but it could be an, an hypothesis and that could be related to some of the neurological uh, symptoms. And then, of course, we have to consider that there is a genetic predisposition to suffer from headache in the acute and post-acute uh, phase. And for example, uh, the uh, COVID-19 host genetics initiative have uh, discovered different, found different uh, genomic loci that are associated with coronavirus infection. And five of them, the ones that are listed uh, in this slide, are also reported to be um, associated with migraine susceptibility. So there could be somehow an overlap. So now the question is uh, how these pathophysiological mechanisms fit into our clinical findings and our clinical observations. So do you remember uh, patient number one? Patient number one had a personal uh, history of episodic migraine, and she started suffering from uh, more severe headaches since the acute phase of the infection. So the question here is, is this a de novo headache in a migraine patient? Or maybe what we can hypothesize is, actually, is that maybe the persistent inflammation, then the brain damage, can actually lead to migraine chronification. So the future studies should actually investigate whether infections can be factors for chronification in migraine. And then we have patient two. Patient two uh, has, um, ha didn't have a personal migraine history, but uh, she started suffering from severe headache since the acute phase of the infection. So she has a de novo headache with migraine-like features, but this is like more long lasting. So the question here is whether some uh, individuals with a genetic predisposition uh, for migraine can trigger migraine after the infection. So the infection somehow, the question is if the infection could uh, uncover uh, previously unrecognized illness. So in this case, uh, migraine. And then we have patient three. Patient three has no personal uh, history of, uh, of migraine, but, and also uh, didn't, ex, uh, didn't report headache in the acute phase, but his headache started after the resolution of the infection. So this is as the novel headache with um, migraine-like features, but with a delayed onset. Uh, so here the, the question is, could autoimmunity be responsible for this delayed onset, uh, the novel headache? And I'm, I'm sure that everyone has read or has uh, listened about the, the new study associating, confirming the association between the Epstein-Barr virus and, um, and multiple sclerosis. So the question is, here is, could the infection, coronavirus, uh, trigger uh, a genetic disorder? And specifically, could uh, coronavirus trigger migraine? So all this pathophysiological mechanism in these clinical cases, actually, uh, we really need to understand them because this has an impact in treatment. So for example, our three cases, we, at the beginning, we uh, treated them in a similar way using onobotulinum toxin A and amitriptyline. And what we observed is that, for example, patient one and patient two had uh, improvement while uh, patient three did not. So as a conclusion, a uh, headache is a common and disabling symptom after the resolution of, um, of the acute phase of COVID-19. Differences observed among patients in clinical practice suggest multiple pathophysiological mechanisms, and the different underlying pathophysiology may be responsible for different clinical phenotypes as well as different treatment responses. And research on headache after the acute phase of COVID-19 is necessary to better uh, to offer better uh, treatment option to our patient in future and represents an opportunity to better understand both primary and secondary headache disorders. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Eduardo, for an excellent uh, lecture on this interesting topic. And also thank you so much to Patricia for uh, talking about uh, COVID-19 and headache and all this interesting data that is uh, coming out. Uh, before we move on to the next uh, speaker, I would like to uh, urge you to write questions uh, via the, the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your, your screen, because we will have um, uh, 30 to 40 minutes afterwards to, to uh, answer all of the questions uh, that, that is asked. So, so please go ahead and, and write questions. Uh, all the lecturers will stick around and uh, help answering these uh, questions. Uh, now I'd like to move on to the next speaker, uh, who is uh, Dr. Garcia uh, Asurin. Uh, David is a headache specialist and neurologist at the headache unit of uh, Valladolid University Hospital in Spain. He completed his Master of Headache uh, Disorders at the University of Copenhagen in 2020, and then went on to finish his PhD in headache medicine in 2021. Uh, uh, Dr. Garcia Azurin has collaborated with the World Health Organization in development of guidelines in, uh, on thrombosis uh, following COVID uh, vaccines. So he's an excellent lecturer for this uh, topic. Uh, he's also chair in the International Headache Society uh, Special Interest Group on Secondary uh, Headaches. And uh, Dr. Garcia Azurin was one of the many doctors who, who really went to work and uh, worked at COVID units uh, during the first wave uh, of uh, COVID-19 uh, in, in Spain. But he not, he not just uh, went to work uh, as a doctor, he also went to job uh, to, to the job as a researcher. And uh, it's amazing, but he has actually published uh, 31 uh, publication on um, issues regarding uh, COVID-19 since the pandemic uh, started. So uh, I look very much forward to your talk, uh, David, about headache in COVID-19 uh, vaccine-induced thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome. syndrome. Thank you very much, Henry, for your kind introduction. Thank you also, Marcio, for the invitation. And I would like to thank and congratulate Eduardo and Patricia for their participation and great lecture. Today, I will discuss about the headache in the thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome. Uh, here you can see my disclosures. And the, this is the agenda for today. So we will start by uh, an introduction and we will go through the entire condition, which it may not be that familiar as a COVID headache, but uh, we will do our best to uh, review it in detail. So this is our enemy, COVID-19. And uh, this virus has caused a lot of trouble to, to us. And uh, by December 2020, there were, already, there were already 79 million people who had been infected and 1.7 million people who died due to COVID-19 across the globe. And uh, we had uh, no effective drugs. All the clinical trials had failed. There were only uh, surrogate uh, endpoints who were positive but uh, the treatment of uh, COVID-19 infection was mainly symptomatic. And indeed, the reinfection was possible. Many people have uh, reinfected with the Omicron variant. So we were losing our battle against COVID-19 and we needed effective uh, treatments. Suddenly, uh, by December 2020, we started to vaccinate all the population. And we observed, uh, as you can see here in Israel, uh, that the, the administration of the vaccines to the population was associated with a decrease in the incidence of uh, COVID-19 cases. By March uh, 7, 300 million doses of COVID vaccines had been already uh, administered. So the rhythm of vaccination was relatively good in, in many countries, not in every, in every country. But uh, suddenly on March the 7th, we had the, the first problem, large problem, uh, big problem associated with the COVID vaccines. And the, there were some European countries with Austria being the first one that reported uh, cases of uh, severe thrombosis in people who had been vaccinated. Uh, the European Medicines Agency uh, made a, an urgent meeting 
of the Pharmacovigilant Risk Assessment Committee, and they concluded that there was a possible association between, between the use of uh, non-replicant adenovirus vector vaccines versus the COVID-19 and these thrombotic events. So now we will define what is this thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome uh, following COVID vaccines. This is a syndrome which is defined by the presence of thrombosis, which can be venous or and or arterial. In about 30 to 40 percent of the patients, there are multiple organ thrombosis, and the, these thromboses do not occur in the typical locations that we are familiar with, which are the uh, deep, deep brain thrombosis and the pulmonary emboli. Uh, in this syndrome, the most frequent location are the cerebral veins but uh, also the esplachnic vessels are a common location of thrombosis, which are not very frequent in the general population. These patients also suffered from a very severe thrombocytopenia with platelet count values uh, below 50,000 in median, and the mortality of this syndrome was uh, significantly higher to that of the thrombosis that we see in the clinical practice. Which is the pathophysiology of this condition? This syndrome seems to be related with the uh, antiplatelet factor for antibodies. The antiplatelet factor for uh, binds to a, an anion, which is not currently uh, defined or discovered. And this leads to a, an antigen uh, conformational change in the uh, platelet factor four, which makes that uh, the antibodies uh, bind to this uh, neocomplex. And these immunocomplexes, which are made by the platelet factor four, the polyanion and the antibodies bind to the platelet uh, receptors. And this causes a uh, platelet activation, uh, aggregation, and also the platelet consumption, leading to the thrombin generation and the thrombosis. You can see on the right side that the, the pathological findings uh, uh, show uh, micro and, and micro and macro uh, thrombosis in different organs in the patients. How frequent is this condition? Well, to evaluate the frequency, we can use two different assessments. The first is the crude rate, and the second is the standardized morbidity ratio. The crude rate uh, describes the number of uh, TTS cases per 100,000 uh, doses of vaccines. And this usually comes from passive reporting sy systems, uh, mainly from pharmacovigilance offices from the different countries. In contrast, the standardized morbidity ratio gives us a different uh, uh, information, which is the number of cases that have been observer, observed compared with the number of, of cases that were expected in, the, in that population over that time period. And this is important because when the value is higher than one, it seems that the, this, uh, the frequency of observed case, cases is higher than the expected, which uh, supports uh, an epidemiological association. Because of course, that uh, so many people have been vaccinated that all the diseases are occurring in everyone. So it doesn't mean that the vaccines cause all the problems that we have. How frequent is the TTS concerning the crude rate? Well, most of the studies agree on a rate which is between one and two cases per 100,000 100, uh, first doses. And uh, surprisingly, the frequency after the second dose is significantly lower between uh, 0.2 and 0.4 uh, cases per 100,000 doses. Uh, it is very relevant that the frequency of this syndrome is significantly higher in younger patients. And uh, in the UK, they reported that the number of uh, cases, uh, the crude rate, reached uh, one case per 50,000 patients. Here you can see the first uh, epidemiological data that the European Medicines Agency uh, published regarding the standardized morbidity ratio, which is the observed to expected analysis. And as you can see, in the patients who were younger than 60 years, there was a statistically significant association between the uh, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis with thrombocytopenia, but also without thrombocytopenia, particularly in younger individuals. And uh, this is data from Denmark and Norway who uh, published the uh, uh, country-level data 
uh, when all these events were reported. And you can see also that the observer to expected uh, uh, rate of uh, travel venous sinus thrombosis was 20 times higher than the expected. So there was a strong association. Which are the risk factors of this uh, syndrome? Well, uh, there, are, there are no clear risk factors other than younger age. Uh, there is no evidence that the, the presence of other traditional risk factors for thrombosis play a cumulative role or increase the risk of having a TTS. And uh, importantly, the use of a non-replicant adenovirus vector-based vaccine is a necessary condition. These vaccines are the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine and also the Janssen vaccine. So then how, we do, how do we define the TTS? Well, this syndrome is defined by the combination of, as we mentioned, a single or multiple organ venous or arterial thrombosis in combination with severe thrombocytopenia. But this may be problematic because uh, uh, this combination of thrombosis with thrombocytopenia may occur also in other diseases like heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, dengue infection, other hematological conditions. So we need to differentiate and to make a, a differential diagnosis with other conditions, mainly with thrombocytopenia and thrombosis. And the, it has been described that the, in patients who, get, who are va being vaccinated, there is an increased rate of thrombocytopenia and also a slightly increased rate of thrombosis, as we saw in the European Medicines Agency data. And this is related with the uh, immune thrombocytopenia. And in the case of thrombosis, this may be related with the systemic inflammation uh, that is associated with the vaccination during the acute phase. So how can we differentiate between this and the real thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome? Well, in this syndrome, the thrombocytopenia is usually very marked, which do not occur in the normal thrombosis. And there is also a significant increase in the D-dimer values. So uh, we should define this as vaccine-induced thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome in the presence of the thrombosis and thrombocytopenia, but in combination with the antiplatelet factor four. And this should be determined by using ELISA or platelet function assays instead of a rapid tests, which are not reliable because uh, low sensitivity and specificity. And uh, as we say in the international uh, classification of headache disorders, this uh, should not be better explained for by another disorder. And the, we may face the problem that uh, uh, not in all the locations we are accessible diagnostic uh, modalities. For instance, MRI uh, may not be accessible in some low and middle income countries and the, the antiplatelet factor for antibodies may take some time prior to the uh, result. So the WHO created a, a table with uh, three levels of certainty depending on, on the findings of uh, the study, the work. And the, uh, as we mentioned, the confirmed case uh, is defined by the presence of antibodies, but you can still suspect a TTS in a patient who may not fulfill all the criteria. But in general, the philosophy of this classification is the, that the more unusual the thrombosis location is, the more likely the TTS, the more severe the thrombocytopenia and the higher the D-dimer, also the more likely the TTS. And the, the key question here is why headache is important. A headache is frequent in cerebral venous in thrombosis, but it, it is also common in uh, following the administration of COVID vaccines. And the, what happens in patients with uh, TTS but no cerebral venous in thrombosis? So we will learn this uh, in, a, in a minute. So headache is the most frequent symptom in cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. The frequency is between 80 to 90% of the patients and they may be associated with the pathophysiology of the cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. Patients who experience headache may be, uh, the headache may be a symptom of uh, an intracranial hemorrhage and may be related with the presence of venous infarcts or uh, venous vascular congestion. And uh, in the case of uh, uh, headache in CVT, all the patients who had the 
headache in CBT had red flags in a study that we did in, in Madrid uh, a few years ago. Uh, regarding COVID vaccines, uh, headache is the second most frequent symptom following the administration of COVID vaccines, which is maybe a problem uh, because uh, half of the people who is vaccinated uh, has headache. But uh, in this case, the headache usually starts within the first uh, 48 hours. The median duration if, uh, is a couple of days. There are some patients who have a, a more persistent uh, headache. And the phenotype of the headache is uh, relatively similar to of a tension type headache, but uh, other uh, systemic symptoms like fatigue and chills are also common. And uh, the headache has been reported to be more frequent and more severe in patients with prior history of COVID-19 and also prior history of uh, migraine and other primary headache disorders. Uh, in the secondary headache special interest group, we analyzed uh, how could we differentiate between the headache of the normal headache following a vaccination and the headache of uh, TTS? And we observed that uh, some remarkable finding was that uh, the headache in TTS has a delayed onset. And this may be related with the fact that uh, you need some time to create the antiplatelet factor for antibodies in contrast to the headache uh, in following a normal vaccination, which is associated with the hyperacute inflammation, uh, which occurs uh, after the vaccination. And uh, recently, some uh, cases have been re re um, reported in patients with TTS, but without cerebral venous inner thrombosis. And you may be careful because uh, cerebral venous inner thrombosis is an elusive di diagnosis and the, the under under diagnosis is relatively common. But uh, in some reported cases, uh, the researchers had, had carefully ruled out the presence of a cerebral thrombosis. So we will see why can this occur. There are some cases who report the presence of headache, which led the patient to the uh, emergency department. There was a, a, a substantial public awareness and many people was uh, familiar with this uh, condition. And the, in this case, as you can see here, a patient presented to the emergency department with thrombocytopenia and also with increased d dimer levels. And the, at the first evaluation, there was no uh, cerebral venous inner thrombosis, which was uh, lately diagnosed. Uh, one of the most relevant uh, findings recently was uh, this study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, who reported a series of uh, 13 patients who had a headache in the absence of a cerebral venous thrombosis. And in this study, uh, the uh, investigators uh, did a complete workup of patients and they ruled out the presence of uh, uh, cerebral venous venous thrombosis. So this is very relevant because uh, there might be a pre-symptomatic or a preclinical manifestations which has recently been named as pre-VITT. And in this case, it is defined by the presence of headache in combination with severe thrombocytopenia, increased D-dimer, and also the presence of antiplatelet factor for antibodies. So how should we proceed in case we are in the clinical practice and we may have a potential case? So if you have a vaccinated individual who complains of headache or any other uh, symptom that may be associated with a thrombotic event, you should uh, promptly uh, evaluate the platelet count and the D-dimer. If possible, antiplatelet factor 4 should be determined properly by using an ELISA method, and uh, you should do also a peripheral smear. If uh, you confirm the presence of uh, thrombocytopenia, then you should try to confirm where the thrombosis is located. And uh, depending of the uh, certainty that you have uh, regarding the thrombosis, if you have uh, the adequate diagnostic resources and you can detect a thrombosis, then you will be able to uh, increase the likelihood of uh, a TTS. If you are in a, in a resource limited uh, setting and you don't have uh, available uh, imaging methods, you can still or you should still treat the patient as a potential case of TTS. And the, the philosophy of the treatment is that uh, you should treat both the immune mediated phenomenon and also the thrombosis.
And the, here there is a remarkable uh, issue, which is that the NT platelet factor four are the antibodies that uh, are part of the heparin-induced thrombocytopenia syndrome, and this may have uh, uh, relevance for the treatment. When, when the first edition of the WHO guidelines were published, WHO advised against the use of heparin between, because of the similarity between the TTS and the heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. But uh, they uh, acknowledged that the, the degree of certainty was very low. Currently, we are reviewing these uh, guidelines and we will um, review whether we should uh, recommend or not the use of uh, heparin. And uh, uh, it was all, also clearly recommended the uh, avoidance of a platelet infusion because it has been associated with a worsening of the clinical condition and the, the use of uh, immunoglobulins and also non-heparin-based anticoagulants is recommended. So if you have a suspected case, you should hospitalize the patient because uh, as we have learned, uh, the patient may experience a delayed thrombotic event. You should monitor the platelet count and the D-dimer, uh, and the, the treatment is based on the use of uh, non-heparin-based anticoagulants and also the treatment of the immune-mediated phenomenon. If you have IVIG available, this is the preferred option, uh, but also steroids can be used and uh, plasma exchange in the absence of uh, other immune-mediated uh, phenomenon. And concerning the anticoagulants, any non-heparin-based anticoagulant can be used uh, with no clear preference uh, of one uh, from the others. Uh, this may be based on the availability and the experience that the clinicians may have. And the, the problem of heparin is that uh, heparin is probably the most uh, widely available uh, anticoagulant and the no other anticoagulants are listed in the essential medicines list. And the most recent evidence suggests that uh, heparin may be safe in 95% of patients with TTS. And the, this is related with the fact that the, the, the platelet epitope uh, where the antibodies bind is the same where the heparin does. So in fact, it could be uh, even more beneficial than other treatments. And uh, uh, finally, uh, some words about the outcome. The mortality rates are currently in a global setting around 28%. They decrease from around 50 to 20%. And there are some countries who report uh, uh, mortality rates between 5 to 10%, like Australia. This could be related with a higher public awareness and early uh, access to treatment and the use of the most adequate treatments. There are some predictors of mortality, like the presence of uh, intracranial hemorrhage, the loca localization of the thrombosis, and uh, having a lower platelet count. So this may be also important in the clinical case management. So as take home messages, I would like to emphasize that this is a, an infrequent symptom with a incidents around a case per 100,000 doses of COVID vaccines. This must be suspected in every patient with delayed onset headache following the administration of a non-replicant adenovirus vector vaccine. Uh, the most useful tools that should be promptly monitored are the platelet count, the D-dimer, and also the blood smear. Headache might occur also in the absence of a cerebral thrombosis, but this is not an easy uh, diagnosis. So the patients ma must underwent the adequate imaging modalities, including venous sequences. Uh, if you suspect TTS, you should uh, check the antiplatelet factor for by using ELISA methods not the rapid tests, and the treatment should not be delayed and must target the immune system and also the thrombosis. Uh, if uh, you have access to non-heparin-based anticoagulants, this should be preferred. And this is everything from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Uh, congratulations for the great presentation to you, to Patricia and Eduardo. And now we start the Q&A session. I still encourage everyone who has questions to send in the Q&A button, which is down in your Zoom and your bar. 
Uh, we will start with uh, Andreas Gantenbein, who asks, how do we know that the symptoms are due to infection and not due to other reasons like morbidity, social factors, and etc.? I think it might be addressed to Eduardo and Patricia. Well, that's an excellent question, I would say. We don't know, of course, um, you know, why headache starts after um, probably such a traumatic also event, uh, suffering from COVID, especially, I would say, in the first wave, uh, where we all were confined. When you went to the hospital, uh, you didn't know what would happen. Your family members could not come and visit. Um, many also people have lost, as Marsha was saying at the beginning, family members, their jobs. Uh, there's a big economic crisis also, at least, for example, here in Spain. So um, absolutely, Andy, you're right. Uh, we, we don't know. I would say that, um, you know, as Eduardo was already mentioning, and I, you can give your thoughts to uh, Eduardo and, and even you know, David, but uh, probably the initial months look look a lot like, um, I would say, a process that is resolving itself. And then we have this 20% of patients or a group of them, which have this ongoing, persistent, long COVID, whatever you want to call it. And these, uh, you know, people, we have to find out what is going on with them. With them. However, uh, Eduardo showed some of the immunological already, um, studies that have been done in relation to this virus. And it does seem that at least in animal models and in some brain imaging, there is um, the appearance of, for example, even Lewy bodies inclusions that um, the whole system, I mean, the whole brain really suffers a bit from, uh, you know, this virus. In we don't know if it's only immunology or if it's maybe a direct effect of the virus. So at the end, there are so many things going on. Um, that I would say that as clinicians, we can try to hypothesize and we can try to help um, basic researchers with our, you know, observations. But the reality is that we have patients that are, you know, with problems and we need to, and a lot of headache, and we need to help them. Good. Uh, thank you. So moving on to the next uh, question, it, it's from uh, Shirin uh, Fati, and it's a patient uh, story. And I don't think we should go into the specifics of, uh, of, uh, of this uh, case, but more generalize it. Um, so someone who begins having a migraine-like uh, headache, likely after a, a, a COVID-19 uh, inf infection, which is uh, not responding to all um, preventives and with normal MRI and, and no signs of sinus uh, thrombosis, could uh, CGRP uh, antibodies uh, have a role in, in the treatment of that? Um, yeah, well, um, yeah, this is... We don't, I mean, we don't have personal experience on that because in Spain there are restrictions for prescription for this medication, but it is true that it will be something interesting, uh, considering that if we hypothesize that then in some cases there could be um, a migraine, migraine could be uh, an underlying mechanism, maybe uh, it's something that should be, I, I, I don't want to say it should be tried, but maybe something that we should, uh, if the patient in the end is, uh, is uh, disa disabled because of the con this condition, maybe trying another, another option of the treatment is something that uh, we should, um, should consider. Although, of course, there is no... Um, no specific indication for these uh, patients. But yeah, I mean, I guess that um, the, the migraine-like phenotypes, in the end, what we do in our clinical practice is that when we have, when we see a migraine phenotype, we try to treat the migraine phenotypes with the, the preventives that we had. So maybe it could be an interesting option, although I have no personal experience on, on that. Thank you, Eduardo. Uh, next question also from Andreas Gentenbein. Uh, he's asking about uh, other type of possible triggers of chronic headache. So 
it is quite interesting that we also see around 20% of chronic headache after a mild tra traumatic brain injury or whiplash. Could you comment on that? I think still for Eduardo and Patricia. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, well, this is interesting, yes. I think uh, I, we also thought about that. Actually, we also thought that it was, I mean, some of the present the manifestation of the post-concussion uh, syndromes sometimes looks uh, look like the post-COVID-19 uh, con condition. So, um, I, I mean, what we... The, the thing is uh, whether the brain somehow, uh, I don't know, this is, this is a provocative question too, <laughs> whether the brain somehow, I mean, we, we have different type of injuries that in the end can act on the brain, but maybe uh, these different injuries, they can elicit some of uh, the same mechanisms. You know, there are probably a different initiating mechanism, but then some of the others may be, you know, they may, they may converge in some others, similar mechanisms that in the end are the expression of this um, of the fact that different uh, secondary headache in the end may have these migraine-like features and also in the, the persistence of these symptoms is also associated with other symptoms like in the post-concussion. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And the next question is from uh, Shamai uh, Gennady and it's uh, along the line of the last question I had. And it's uh, what are the treatment offered to those patients with post-COVID migraine-like um, headaches? So if you have a patient with persistent uh, migraine-like headache after COVID-19, what would you do uh, as an neurologist in trying to, to treat it? Maybe Eduardo or Patricia? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Can, can you repeat the question? Yeah. How to treat these patients, you mean? Yeah, if they have a migraine-like phenotype, so would you start off yeah. with the beta blockers, candesatine? Yeah. Or... Well, what, what we did, I mean, uh, these patients were coming to our outpatient clinic and we were like the last chance for them because they had already uh, spent many months with their general practitioners, with other neurologists, uh, not headache specialists. So uh, they had already tried some of the, some of preventives and some, um, some other treatments. The, the question here is um, they were highly disabled. So in some patients, we tried to like to combine different treatment at the same time. We have to, to think about that this is not just pain. It is also, there are also other comorbid conditions that are really, really relevant in this patient, like the insomnia, uh, they, have, they can have mood disorder. So we really have to uh, try to uh, combine different treatment at the same, at the same times. So many of the, our patients at the beginning uh, where we were administering uh, both adenobotulinum toxin A and amitriptyline because most of them, they were um, complaining also of insomnia. So in order to uh, tackle both headache and uh, insomnia with, uh, with the amitriptyline and then the, the adenobotulinum toxin as a way to peripherally act on this system that may be more inflamed and more... Um, more irritated somehow <laughs> from the from the periphery from the periphery after the, the infection, and we had mm, some good results, and of course other patients that did not respond. The other the other thing, one just very quick thing that I want to remind people about is that many of these patients are overusing also acute mm. medications after so many months. So uh, what we were trying in a way to do is almost in some detoxify or try to let them know that they're not improving if they're also increasing um, all of the acute analgesic use and uh, try to avoid, you know, after such a long disease in a way, uh, a lot of, you know, if you, if you can, so drugs that go, you know, within the system. So that's why onabotulinum toxin was, um, has been one of our preferred approaches. So just a follow-up question, do you have numbers of how many who had medication overuse uh, headache uh, in, in your uh, clinic? Almost, almost every patient that was coming to our headache unit was almost, I mean, was overusing. Then it is true that it, when you explain them, uh, they're not like overusers that they really keep on overuse. Actually, most of them, they didn't want to overuse. It was just the solution they were given, you know. So um, I would say that at the, at the first visit, many of them actually overuse. But, um, no, I mean, in the end, not all of them, they, they keep overusing. Mm 
just yeah, I would say that. I, I don't have like a strict number. Our court is small, but still. Thank you. I'll jump to the next question, which is in the same subject. Do you use either for these uh, patients with overuse medication or just for the uh, persistent headache to have experience with cranial nerve blocks from Maria Teresa Goycochea? Yeah, yes, we have performed some, but the feeling, my personal feeling is that they, uh, they do not work. So yeah, we tried with some with some patient, but they, they do not work. This is my personal feeling. So yeah, we have we have to consider that most of the patients they they have uh, headaches, you know, for 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 months and months and months. So maybe in the acute phase that could be like a good way, you know, to, to give a patient relief. And maybe, but yeah, uh, the post acute is I won't I won't say they are useful, honestly. Good. And uh, the next question is about uh, different uh, variants of coronavirus like Delta and Omicron. Is there any difference in headache phenotype and symptoms in these different uh, variants? This is from a very interesting question from Marcin uh, Kopka. Mm, yeah. Well, uh, I have the... Um, about the phenotype itself, I have um, I don't have the feeling that it changes that much. In the end, if they have persistent headache, they come and the, the the phenotype is it's similar. But what I have the feeling is that uh, with now the Delta and Omicron, we are seeing less persistent headache. This is I mean I see that like the referrals that we have because of this. Uh, for persistent uh, COVID-19 headache, I would say that uh, the first waves of the pandemic, they, we had a high level of, uh, I mean, we had quite a relevant number of referrals, but now with the Delta and and uh, the Omicron, not that much. I think that they, they because patients, they tell you that they have headache and they have severe headache with this uh, type of um, infection, but I'm seeing less, uh, the novel headache in this referrals for this for this reason. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. I think this is also very important. That's why, sorry, just uh, Henry. That's why when I was talking, I was always saying that all of the cohorts that are now studied, or almost all of them, come from uh, the initial uh, wave of the pandemic. Uh, so that is something to be, you know, a, a food for mm -hmm. thought. We'll see mm -hmm. how then the rest of of this new uh, variants. You know how i mean acute headache is clear i would say in these new variants too but uh, post-acute and long uh, persistent headache uh, we will see what happens there so i was just wondering could it be that it's maybe the de degree of the infection and also uh, you know if they have been hy hypoxic uh, been on ventilators uh, so those who are coming now who have been vaccinated and, and might have, uh, you know, less intense uh, infections, that that's that might be one of the reasons why they do not. There's not that many who have or, and develop persistent uh, post-COVID. Uh, one thing is also that many of them were also vaccinated afterwards, uh, even if after hearing David, which I'm sure he will get now a bunch of questions too. Um, maybe everyone is scared of getting vaccinated. Uh, I think vaccination has been very useful for everyone. And so probably not only the, the variant is less aggressive as you were already kind of yeah, mentioning Hendrik, but it's also, I think, the fact that uh, we have almost prepared the body you know, to receive uh, this. And then the whole, as you're saying, uh, severity of the illness is, is more controlled, you could say. And then if we think of maybe also part of, um, which is for sure a bit true too, what um, uh, and Dr. Gantenbein was mentioning at the beginning, probably also the stress around uh, suffering from this virus has probably also uh, you know, gone down. However, as I said, uh, with this new variant, we are seeing a lot of acute headache. But uh, yeah, we'll see how then everything kind of evolves in the, in the next month. Good. And now we really invite David for the discussion with uh, Alejandro Marfil Rivera's uh, question. He asks, Has you, have you seen any data on cerebral venous thrombosis and antiplatelet 4 factor 
uh, in COVID, not in vaccinated patients? These uh, antibodies seem to be quite uh, <clears throat> exclusive of this uh, disorder or heparin induced thrombocytopenia. There are a few case reports now with uh, other uh, patients, but uh, it doesn't seem to be frequent in COVID patients. And also, uh, cerebral venous thrombosis is frequent in patients who get infected by COVID. It is uh, around between 10 and 100 times more frequent than following the uh, COVID vaccines. So this is also important to uh, assess the benefit uh, risk uh, uh, assessment. And the, in patients with cerebral venous thrombosis in COVID, there is no thrombocytopenia usually. And in case it's present, it is mild. Great. Uh, the next uh, question is from our good colleague, Maria Teresa Cochea, uh, and it's about inflammation. Considering the inflammation phenomenon in COVID headache, could uh, steroids be useful in the treatment? Yes, uh, well, this is a good question. Uh, I have a uh, controversial experience with that in a way that um, I have some patients that they they didn't respond to, they, they already came and they already tried uh, long, um, long treatments with, I mean, long treatment, they had, they tried cortico corticosteroids for, for, for several days. And then I have some patient that they actually, uh, and they didn't respond. And I have some patient that actually they uh, did respond. I mean, in a way that with the corticoids, their uh, headache uh, improved, but then when you, when you, uh, you taper down, you do, you, you do it properly. But in the end, after the, the, the corticoids, uh, they worsen again so much that, I mean, you, they seems like they are a little bit corticoid dependent, but you cannot keep them, uh, uh all the time with corticoids, the corticoid stress. So, um, so maybe for some patient that the inflammation can still be uh, this local inflammation. Maybe it is real. I mean, uh, because some somehow they are really um, dependent on that. I have this. This they are like, oh, can you give me again? Of course, you can say, well, I don't think so, because you know they had already done that for a long time. Hmm. Great. Uh, next two questions I think we have already addressed. The first one from Dr. Inurozi uh, regarding nerve blocks. Second one from Mariana Costa regarding anti-CGRP antibodies. Uh, so I'll jump to Shadi Azefiran, who asks, if you face on with an hemorrhagic CVT, David, David, will you wait for the result of an antiplatelet for, for starting an anti anticoagulant other than heparin? in suspected VITT? If you consider the possibility of a TTS, you should start treatment as soon as possible. And uh, if a TTS is a possibility, you should treat it as a TTS. So it means that uh, if you have available non-heparin-based anticoagulants, this should be preferred. And uh, um, you shouldn't wait for the result of the anti platelet factor for antibodies because this may take uh, more than one day, sometimes uh, even a week. So you should start, start the treatment. It is controversial that uh, if you don't have access to non-heparin-based anticoagulants, uh, whether you should use heparin. And now uh, there are some experts who advise uh, for the use of heparin. Also, if you have a hemorrhagic uh, uh, CVT, uh, in the same way that we treat in the normal CVT out of the vaccination, you should also uh, use anticoagulants unless the um, thrombocytopenia is very, very severe, which would be one of the few indications for a, a, a intravascular, endovascular treatment and uh, sometimes the uh, transfusion of, of platelets if you need a, an urgent surgery. But otherwise, uh, you should treat uh, the patient with uh, anticoagulants. Thank you so much. Uh, and the next question is also for David, because this is about the SNOOP-10 uh, uh, mnemonic, uh, which is uh, something that was published by the Special Interest Group on Secondary Headaches in Neurology some years ago. Uh, it's from Marcelo uh, Calderao. 
And he's asking, should we now rename uh, Snoop Pete, uh, Snoop 10 to Snoop uh, uh, 10V, V for standing for vaccination, uh, since this can be the one and only red flag in these uh, patients. So a very good uh, and provocative question from Marcelo. Indeed, if you check the Snoop 10 list, you will find that uh, there are two red flags which are present in every uh, TTS patient. The first is uh, an new onset headache or a change in a pre-existing headache. And the second is the uh, temporal relationship between the uh, headache and an intervention or a drug. So uh, the Snoop 10 is sensitive and they would be able to uh, tell you that there is something unusual and then you should uh, study the patient in a deeper detail. Great, thank you. And from Francesca Puleda, She's asking, are there problems that you know of uh, anti-CGRP preventives and COVID vaccines being administered in short temporal distances, i.e. one day after the other? Would you recommend waiting between treatments? To Patricia and Eduardo. Well, we actually, I mean, Eduardo can, can answer, uh, you know, I'm just... Um... Yeah, well, we initially looked into this. Uh, we have, I would say, data that comes from a multicentric um, registry that we, we started uh, two years ago. But uh, then our own experience, I would say that it doesn't seem to be, you know, there. I don't think there are any issues. Um, but I understood that the question, just so that Eduardo can finish up my answer, um, is related to acute um COVID or to post-acute COVID? So I'm not sure where... To COVID vaccine, actually. Ah, COVID vaccine. Sorry. COVID vaccine and anti-CGRP treatment. Should we have any time distance or they should? there is no contraindication to use both in one day after the other, for example? So the official answer is that we don't have enough uh, data in that regard. But David and, and Eduardo can uh, maybe you know, give their thoughts on it. Yeah, no well, one says anything. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I agree with you. There are no, no, there are not enough data to say to say. Yeah, it's fine, totally fine. Mm, I have patients that they had the vaccination close to their uh, monoclonal antibody injection, and nothing happened. I mean, the the one that I mean, nothing happened. But yeah, there are no. It was not systematic. It has not been systematically evaluated. I, I cannot say whether. This is, um, you know, it is, I mean, always it's better to have some precaution, but I don't know. <laughs> I, I would add that uh, I have seen many patients recently that uh, when you check the calendar and you see suddenly many marked days uh, with headache, I ask, uh, when, got you, when did you got the vaccinated? And they tell you that day, and then uh, you have the explanation for the worsening. So this may be also uh, something that you may consider and uh, take into account uh, when deciding whether the treatment was effective or not, because this can uh, influence the outcome, the outcome of uh, the antibodies. Great, thank you. Uh, I think we'll skip the next uh, question because you already talked about this uh, with the different symptoms that patients have uh, that it's similar to to infections. So we'll move to the questions uh, regard from uh, Marcelo. Uh, Calderao, uh, in the beginning uh, of the pandemics, we used to perform a lumbar puncture for every new onset headache patient, which were normal in most cases. Uh, do you think it's safe not to do lumbar puncture on those patients in the absence of other uh, red flags? So I think it's uh, directed at David mostly. I think that uh, if this refers to a headache following COVID-19 or during the pandemic, you should treat the patient uh, as any other headache patient. And uh, if you suspect a secondary headache disorder, then you should uh, uh, complete the workup. But probably I would do first uh, an MRI, uh, perhaps with a contrast administration rather than uh, an LP. And uh, if you have uh, some uh, phenotypic uh, features that may suggest uh, uh, orthostatic uh, headache or a... Uh, uh, intracranial inflammation, then you may consider the lumbar tap. But uh, I would say that we do not do uh, LP 
in the, our post-COVID patients regularly because uh, mm, it doesn't seem to be uh, useful and uh, we are not able to isolate uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 in uh, most cases. Thank you, David. And next question for you too, uh, from Raquel Gilgovea. Uh, could headache in TTS in the absence of a CVT be related to small vessel venous cortical or meningeal thrombosis? Yeah, I, I didn't uh, describe anything about the headache phenotype or about the potential uh, pathophysiology of pre-VITT. And this is a very interesting uh, topic that uh, is currently being investigated and there will be uh, international studies uh, going on. And the, this is one of the uh, potential explanations. The other is uh, uh, intracranial inflammation, but uh, uh, there, are, there were no clear signs of uh, inflammations in the, patient, the patients that were studied. But that I must say that uh, I don't know how precise were these tests to evaluate the presence of intracranial uh, inflammation because uh, an MRV uh, and no LP may not be sufficient to uh, evaluate the uh, uh, focal uh, inflammation. And the pathological findings suggest a little degree of uh, uh, mm, meningeal inflammation. So these are the two main hypotheses. Thank you so much. Uh, the next uh, question is uh, from Franco uh, Cavazzali. Uh, I think it has been touched upon in the lectures, but we can just go over it again. Maybe it's for Patricia. Could any patient develop migraine after an in infection as consequence of a post-COVID syndrome if the patient has never had migraine? Yes. Yes, the answer is yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> very short yes yeah. uh, i think that was i mean you can develop probably migraine all throughout your life but uh, it, it was a bit surprising because uh this cohort of patients that has been as i was already saying initially um carefully studied have a mean age of 50 or 50 something i mean they were quite older you could say patients so not the typical you could say young female uh in, in her 20s or 30s so yeah, and, and, and many of them were male. I mean, so I would say that COVID affected severely in the first wave to people that don't look like the classical migraine, um, I would say patient or phenotype. So that was, I think the, I think is the most surprising, I would say finding and part of this story that uh, that's why Eduardo was mentioning in the pathophysiology um, what is you know behind this and, and we can think of uh, genetic predisposition that had not kind of flourished yet you can think of maybe the harm that uh, actually this virus is doing with all of these inflammatory processes and and maybe even as i was already mentioning a direct um, effect on 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 the brain and the blood brain barrier um, and then maybe as, as as we have already mentioned all of this um, traumatic or post-traumatic even stress that the whole uh, disease probably, you know, um, you know, had, you know, uh, yes, uh, went together with. So all of these factors have actually uh, shown us that many, many patients with no family history or personally, personal history of headache started to develop headache and that this headache mostly had migraine-like features. Thank you, Patricia. Next question coming from Shireen Fatih. I'm not sure if I fully understood, but I'll ask you, David. Uh, please conclude the investigations needed for daily post-COVID migraine, not vaccinated patients. Can it be antiplatelet-4? Uh, and if positive, do you recommend uh, non-aparin-based anticoagulant? I think it might be actually for vaccinated patient to present with new onset a headache. I'm not sure. What do you think, Davi, about this? If, if you have a patient who have not been vaccinated, it cannot be TTS. You need to be vaccinated. And indeed, you need to be vaccinated with adenovirus vector vaccines, which are AstraZeneca, uh, Janssen, and Sputnik uh, mainly. Uh, there are no reported or uh, published cases with other uh, adenovector vaccines. If you have been vaccinated, 
the first test would be a platelet count and the and the dimer. And if you have a, a thrombocytopenia and or increased D dimer, then you may consider uh, antiplatelet factor four, which should be done by uh, ELISA. Uh, if you have a patient with uh, clinical symptoms in combination with uh, thrombocytopenia or increased D dimer, you should you should start the treatment as soon as possible, and should you should not wait for the result of the antiplatelet factor four antibodies. And uh, if if you suspect a TTS. Uh, then you should administer anticoagulants and uh, uh, immunoglobulins if possible. And um, if you have availability for uh, non-heparin-based anticoagulants, these should be preferred in, instead of uh, heparin anticoagulants. <laughs> Thank you so much, David. Um, we have one last question, and then maybe if we have a few moments, we can just take a few from the, the chat. But the last question here is... Um, have you seen more patient with, and this must be multi inflammatory syndrome in children with the new variant. So I don't know if you have children in, in your uh, clinics, is, if this is something that you would uh, know. And I guess the new variant must be Omicron. Well, we, Edo can also answer. I would just quickly say that we are seeing uh, children, but Edo, do you want, I, I saw that you were about to answer. Go ahead, no worries. No, no, yeah, that we have children, but I haven't seen any of these uh, in children yet. Uh, otherwise, maybe they will come because now they, they're going to be more. In, I mean, this new variant is spreading a lot with, uh, among among the young population, so we will see. Fantastic. Uh, I think most of the questions in the chat have already been addressed, so I'd like to thank every attendee for participating in this great webinar. Thank you very much, Patricia, Eduardo, and David. And I'd like to invite you for final words before uh, Henrik closing this session. We, we can start the same order we started the, the, the webinar. So please, Patricia. Well, I, I, um, I want to thank you for the opportunity, as I said, uh, you know, uh, for us to share all of this information. I think that we will keep on updating the knowledge on this. And um, as I already said, when we were starting to understand that, that headache was an important symptom of, of both the um, disease, you know, COVID, also of the post-COVID disease and also vaccine, uh, vaccinations, I think that uh, my wish, you know, for the future would be that uh, the rest of kind of the community, medical community would understand that headache is something more than just a plain, simple symptom. So I want, you know, my wish for the future is that uh, through these initiatives, we also show the rest of the world the importance of uh, understanding, diagnosing and treating appropriately headache, because uh, we see that that still is not happening. Yeah, I completely agree with all uh, what uh, Dr. Posroch has said. And uh, I would like to add that in the end, um, I, I would like to motivate people to, I think it, for me that uh, my PhD candidate was really interesting um, to, to, to this field because in the end, uh, what you are trying to do is to have an impact on, on the community. And uh, it's really uh, sad when you actually see patients because these patients are real and they come and they say, when this will go away, you know? So uh, when they ask you that and you have no answers about that, it's, it's, it's a little bit sad. I think uh, we really, I think it's an interesting field and we really need to learn a lot about this. So I really hope um, that other people will get uh, motivated. Thank you so much, David. And uh, I would like to say that uh, there is no doubt on the benefit of uh, COVID vaccines. This uh, TTS seems to be a very rare uh, condition, which is uh, less frequent than the risk of having a thrombosis if you get infected of COVID, so you better get your vaccine. And if you see a patient with a delayed onset headache following a, a vaccination with an adenovector vaccine, remember to test the platelets and the D-dimer. And the, in case there are some abnormalities, please treat the patient uh, as soon as possible and uh, you can check all the uh, online resources that uh, are available 
for this in case you don't remember. So thank uh, to all my colleagues and uh, thank for all the attendees for this uh, great session that I enjoyed. Thank you so much. So uh, Patricia, Eduardo and David, thank you so much for being ex excellent lecturers. And uh, it's also not easy to uh, answer all these uh, questions, but you did it in an excellent manner. I'd like to thank all the participants for uh, listening and also for asking very good and relevant questions uh, to my co-host, Masiu Natan. It's always a pleasure having these webinars uh, together with you. So thank you for that. And uh, so this is an International Headache Society webinar. It's going to be recorded and it will be on the International Headache uh, Society webpage and also on the YouTube channel. And I think this is such an important uh, topic that it should uh, not only be available for, for members, but also non-members. I think there's so much that can be done within this very interesting field of uh, secondary headaches. And it would be great to, to have a new uh, webinar when we have gathered even more uh, data and uh, experience. So thank you all so much and have a good evening. Thank <laughs> you.